Hey there, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. Before we get into today's show, I have an incredibly important announcement. This is something that I really haven't been more excited to announce than all the way back in 2014 when I first started the Energy Blueprint. After well over a year of development and testing, we are finally ready to officially launch our breakthrough mitochondrial supplement to the world. This is a genuine game changer in the area of human energy enhancement, and it's called Energenesis. This is actually the first no stimulant, no caffeine, and no sugar energy formula that actually builds up your own body's capacity to produce energy. Instead of working like caffeine and stimulants by giving you a temporary boost of energy for a few hours, but ultimately making your energy levels worse over time, Energenesis actually builds up your own body's ability, your cellular capacity to produce energy. Energenesis got over 20 amazing, powerful ingredients at real effective doses. This is a premium formula that uses actual real effective doses. So this is literally like 23 supplements all in one. And with that in mind, just to mention a few testimonials that people have wrote in after using Energenesis. So this one's from Barbara. She said, I'm a 72 year old female and I love, love, love Energenesis. I have more sustained energy through the day and I'm actually getting my life back. I'm doing things that I haven't been able to do for 10 years. Anya, she said, I really love that it gives me just the right kind of steady and balanced energy. Unlike stimulants, which I can't tolerate, Energenesis gives me a perfect smooth kind of energy that lasts throughout the whole day. Michelle Catlin, this is one of my favorite ones, she said, um, Ari, are you getting tired of all the praise and requests for Energenesis yet? I'm on my third bottle and I have to tell you, I haven't felt this good in years. So if you've been struggling with your energy levels and you're looking to get this area of your life handled, and not just to get a temporary boost of energy for a few hours, but to actually transform your energy levels by building real energy at the cellular level, then go get yourself some Energenesis. You can get it at theenergyblueprint.com forward slash Energenesis. So go to that page, check out all the ingredients and all the science behind it, how it works. It's all there. There's about 200 scientific references behind all of the different ingredients in Energenesis. They're all listed on that page along with a lot of the science behind the ingredients. There's also a video explaining it all. Check it all out. Check out the science, then grab yourself some Energenesis and let's get started. I know that you are going to be blown away by the result. The URL is theenergyblueprint.com forward slash Energenesis. And now let's get into the episode. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and today I have with me Seth Conger, who is the CEO and co-founder of Mios Health. Mios Health is a startup with a mission to help people with pre-Alzheimer's to not develop Alzheimer's disease. Every moment in Seth's life has been uh, has led him a step closer to the company's mission, including entertaining and presenting in front of hundreds of thousands of people, helping shape and grow one of the premier brain function improvement facilities in the world, and finally being published as a co-author in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease and Parkinsonism uh, as the only non-doctor for successfully reversing cognitive decline in 100 patient cases in 2018. And I'm very, very excited about the work that his company is doing. Uh, I think it's really a game changer when it comes to treating neurological disease. So I'm, I'm super excited to finally have him on the show to have him talk about this. And I think anybody who's listening to this, who's concerned with the potential to develop neurological disease, especially Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinsonism, um, or has you know, friends or family who are dealing with those, uh, you definitely want to listen to this. So welcome, Seth. Such a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Ari. Appreciate being here. Yeah. So talk to me about Alzheimer's disease. What are you know, some of the, the precursors? You know, in, in your bio, it mentions pre-Alzheimer's. This yeah. sort of phrase, you know, the, it's sort of like pre-diabetes, right? So what are the precursors to Alzheimer's disease? Uh, and can you help? Like, it does knowing that information allow somebody to do interventions to lower their risk of actually developing Alzheimer's? Yeah, so first, the term pre-Alzheimer's um, is something that we came up with. And we, we came up with it because... 
the other terms out there are subjective cognitive decline and mild cognitive impairment. And they, they keep changing these terms around every time they redo the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual um, for Mental Health. And a lot of doctors are confused by the terms. So consumers are really concerned and uh, confused by these terms. So we said it's a lot like prediabetes. It comes before diabetes. So this is pre-Alzheimer's. And that really breaks up into are you at risk for developing Alzheimer's? Do you have symptoms? And can you recognize those symptoms? Or are others recognizing those in you? And that would be subjective cognitive decline. And then there's mild cognitive impairment, which is actually a diagnosable disorder. It's one step away from dementia. Uh, Alzheimer's disease representing about 70% of the cases of dementia. And up until that point, you are still living independently. And that's important. That's kind of the barrier that we see when people no longer can live independently or get through their day-to-day -day tasks independently. That's where we're unable to really see a shift or a change in improving their brain health and overall condition. There are some cases, um, but not enough to really stand on. So it's the individuals who are at risk, that could be genetic risks, that could be underlying chronic conditions um, or you know, others, going into the other parts that really we focus on. So all the way up into that point where you're going to be diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's disease, we find and studies have shown that we can actually reverse cognitive decline in many cases and improve brain function and overall quality of life. Gotcha. So what are some of these factors that, that actually you guys or the, the research community more broadly yep. have identified as the main causative factors in, you know, as far as the reasons people develop Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll throw in an important uh, tidbit here, which is, and you mentioned it in the bio, that I am I am not a doctor. So as I go through all of this, I want I want to make sure that none of this is taken as medical advice. Um, our company, Mios Health, actually works as a medical service provider to work with doctors. So we help people who are in need find the appropriate doctor, and they we work with them to make sure that they have a program that fits their needs and gets them to a desired result. So. With, with that being said, we do see a lot of underlying conditions and it's uh, research has shown up to about three dozen different underlying conditions that can be broken down into various categories that would lead the brain towards a cognitive impairment, uh, potentially Alzheimer's disease. And these are everything from uh, having too much or too little of something, which is you know those two buckets that we can put up there and then it can break down further and further from there. The big issues that we see are toxins in people's systems. Uh, we see a lot of gut issues and dysbiosis. We see mitochondrial issues, which I know you are very, very familiar with, mm -hmm. um, and decreases in energy and, and fatigue. Um, we see a, a ton of issues with metabolic effects. So this would be high blood sugar. So think about diabetes. Some people even call Alzheimer's disease now diabetes type three. Um, and that is a big part of this hypertension and you know, driving into even further other chronic diseases like heart disease. Those also are some of the leading uh, conditions that can point, that, point the brain towards a further decline. But there, there's a key that we have found in this, which is there's a reason some people are able to have these chronic conditions and their brain is not declining and others are. And it seems to be pointing towards the blood brain barrier. And just like your gut, if you have leaky gut, you have a breakdown in your gut barrier. And so the good things can't stay in and get digested and the bad things are getting out and they're you know, becoming systemic. We're seeing the same thing in the brain. So the brain is being penetrated by things that are actually damaging it and insulting it. And the brain is reacting in a way that is potentially a protective mechanism that over time, if left unchecked, creates the symptoms that we associate with cognitive decline. Gotcha. Very interesting. Now, how do lifestyle choices and nutrition play into this? You, you mentioned environmental factors are... Yes. Uh, or sorry, uh, I should say environmental toxins are a big factor. Yes. Um, and you mentioned the blood-brain barrier. 
So, yes. you know, I, I guess the way I like to look at things is we have causes, what I conceptualize as true root causes, generally at the environment, the lifestyle, the nutrition level. Um, yep. in some cases, genetic causes, though I, there's a number of studies that show for most conditions, genetics are playing a very small role. So yep. I, as much as there are some people that really like to emphasize that, I don't agree. And I think that yeah. it's way smarter and you're going to have way better effects by focusing on the environmental, the lifestyle, the nutrition factors. Um, so, you know, kind of that as the root causes, then they converge through certain physiological mechanisms. I'd say conventional, med uh, conventional medicine really likes to, in my view, conflate the physiological mechanisms, you know, right. as causes. Um, but it converges at that level. We know certain things at the physiological mechanism level or the biochemical level go wrong. So for example, the blood brain barrier or gut dysbiosis uh, and the gut barrier or mitochondrial dysfunction and, and so on and so forth. Um, how you, you, you mentioned a big focus is on the, the blood brain barrier. What do you see as the biggest causative factors in terms of lifestyle environment uh, as far as impacting on the blood brain barrier? Well, Ari, I think you, you hit it right on, on the head and the blood brain barrier is even further downstream than we like to start. Right? So we're looking upstream with all of this and we're looking across somebody's lifestyle because we know that the accumulation of their habits over the past 30, 40 years is what's causing what we're physiologically seeing or what we're seeing in their biochemistry as well when we look at lab tests. So some of those most important areas and the causes, is, as you would say, are nutrition, are poor sleep habits, are a really poor mindset, um, lack of purpose, lack of challenging your brain. Uh, you know, we see a lot of different things with that, but I would have to say that you know, the, the top three in the lifestyle areas are sleep, nutrition, and exercise. There's, you know, there's more papers on exercise and brain function than anything else when it comes to improving brain function and actually showing scores with that. So we know that exercise produces more BDNF in the brain, more BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor is an incredible nerve growth factor that can actually produce um, brain cells and communication, right? So, you know, exercise is so important. The nutrition, we'll just, this has to... One yeah. second before we go on to nutrition. I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, and, and I'm sure most people are familiar with this idea that exercise has brain benefits. Yes. But maybe we take something there for granted because it is, in a, in, on one hand, it's like, all right, well, we've already heard that. We know that we accept that. On the other hand, it's kind of odd that doing sure. physical exercise, which exercises your muscles and stresses your muscles and makes your muscles work harder. Of course, we could, you know, it's common sense to say, okay, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make your muscles adapt and make your muscles stronger or improve your muscle endurance or make them grow bigger, et cetera, et cetera. But why would it affect our brain, right? It's not a brain demanding sure. activity. So sure, maybe I'm just curious if you could go into that a little bit. You, you mentioned BDNF, but yep. why? Why does exercise have benefits on our brain? Well, I think in, in when we break this down for most of our clients and they say, they ask that question, like, how can this possibly impact our brain? We say, well, the next time you feel depressed, go for a brisk walk or a run and see how you feel afterwards. The next time you feel really tired or fatigued in the morning, instead of laying on the couch, go outside and get some you know, cardiovascular output to a certain level where you feel strained and breathing hard, and you'll see that your entire mental state changes. Uh, there is a physiological mechanism here that just shifts our mental state. Uh, you know, there, there's many people who talk about this. Tony Robbins says, if you want to change your mindset, change your physical state. So there's a, an incredible amount of mechanisms of action here that allow this to happen to actually change our mental state and change the physiological abilities in the moment. Longer term, 
that has a lot to do with the synaptoplasticity and neuroplasticity in our brain and those connections being made through those nerve growth factors. Um, but it, you know, it's interesting. There's different levels of exercise that work for different people. And this goes into something that I'm sure we'll get into talking about later when we get through lifestyle, which is the personalization of this. Not, you know, if you go out and run for 30 minutes at a eight minute per mile pace, it may do something completely different for you than somebody who has been sedentary for a very long time and can't even hit that pace. That may not even get your brain to that point where you need it to, to actually give you that physiological change. So it really dives into the personalization of what somebody can handle and what they need to be doing in order to get that desired outcome or desired result that they're looking for, not in the moment, but three, six, 12 months down the road. And how do we design a program for them that fits their needs now and their goals later? Got it. Well, I kind of yeah. interrupted us and set us on a digression there, but you were no problem. about to jump into nutrition. Yeah. And, and it, it fits the, fits the same thing. So, you know, all of these loop together and they're all feedback loops as well. So with nutrition, we see that almost everything, all these chronic diseases start in the gut and you wouldn't think that there's a gut brain connection, but there absolutely is. And what we see in the gut is an incredible amount of gut dysbiosis when we're looking at individuals with cognitive decline. And when we see that their cognitive scores are outside of the average range, below average, usually we see triggers and biomarkers that are out of whack and out of balance as well in their gut. Um, it could be everything from we're finding parasites in there to there's leaky gut uh, markers. And with this, again, there is no specific one diet for every single person. Some people come to us and they choose to be vegetarians. And we find a way for them to make sure that they can thrive and get to those goals just as way as people who are, you know, interested in eating meat are. So what we're, what we try to focus them around is eating clean, eating real live things, shopping around the perimeter of their grocery store, making sure that we're talking about the different dimensions of nutrition involving time, not just quality and quantity, but also when they're going to be eating and if they should be going on a fasting regimen and which would be the best for them. So it's again about that personalization, but first it's really for most of the individuals who are experiencing cognitive decline, it's about a big education and a complete remapping of their mindset around what food is. Mm -hmm. right? It's not something which just to grab and go and run and uh, you know, satiate our hunger, but rather it's something to actually fuel our energy, to fuel our cells, our mitochondria, to get us functioning well, and it is the you know the main shifting mechanism that can change our health trajectory towards the future. Mm -hmm. Excellent. What what does the scientific research look like right now as far as this this landscape of neurological disease? As far as uh, for nutrition specifically, or just across the board for reversal? Yeah, wherever you want to take that. I mean, <laughs> as yeah. far as, I mean, I think we could start with nutrition. It might also be worth talking yeah. about, I mean, you mentioned exercise and you mentioned sleep. Yeah. Um, we can look at, I think, a few different aspects of that. So, sure. Okay, so what does the scientific research look like when it comes to sleep and neurological disease? Well, sleep is really interesting. It's, it's really been hitting the front pages of, uh, of newspapers and, and online magazines just in the last year or two as uh, it's gained a little bit more interest from the public of, oh, wow, this is not something that we're just wasting away. Sleep is actually probably the most important uh, lifestyle piece when it has to do with cognitive decline in your brain function when you're sleeping, it is the only time when your brain can actually repair itself. So your brain does not repair itself during the daytime. And, you know, our body has this lymphatic system that flushes out the toxins and takes care of the waste during the day, but our brain doesn't have that. So during sleep and certain specific stages of sleep, our brain actually shrinks by about 2% 
and allow, allows our cerebrospinal fluid to actually flush out toxins and dead cells, and it's called neural pruning at that point. This doesn't happen as well if you're only sleeping six hours a night or five hours a night or four hours a night with the use of sleep aids. And sleeping with sleep aids, certain ones, is not the same as deep restorative natural sleep. So we have kind of an ep epidemic in the country. Um, our, my favorite text on this is Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep, just an incredible book that really lays this out. And he takes a huge deep dive into Alzheimer's disease and a lot of mechanisms of sleep pointing towards risk factors for Alzheimer's. Now we know that when you don't sleep well, you don't digest your food well. When you don't sleep well, you don't recover from the exercise that you, do, you did the day before. When you don't sleep well, you're then fatigued the next day. So your, your brain function, actually your executive function or decision making is lower by about 20 to 50%, depending on if you lost an hour or two of sleep the night before. So you're gonna make poor food choices, you're gonna to be too fatigued to exercise, and then this cycle just repeats itself for years and years as people, people go on. So those, that triad of, of sleep and exercise and nutrition is really important. Now, where we go into the scientific literature, and sorry, I took a little detour to get there, but there's, there's only a couple papers right now that are out there that are actually looking at all of lifestyle in a personalized manner when it comes to improving brain function and reducing the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So there was a, a case study paper that came out a couple years ago that I was honored to, to throw some cases into, and this was by Dale Bredesen, uh, who wrote The End of Alzheimer's Disease. And that was 100 cases showing the reversal of cognitive decline and improved brain function uh, across about 20 different medical practices that were using his education, had been educated by him and using uh, similar protocols. And that was really interesting, but the data wasn't that strong as far as what exactly people were doing because the medical professionals aren't research scientists. They don't have labs set up. They weren't set up to track every movement that people were making. They didn't, we weren't using the same testing in the beginning and the end across the board. So we were kind of hanging our hat on these case studies and we knew that this was working. We knew that a personalized proactive approach was getting us great results, but we didn't have this, this peer reviewed randomized trial that everybody wanted. Now in 2019 at the very tail end in October, Richard Isaacson from um, the Wild Cornell Alzheimer's Prevention Group came out with an incredible paper. And this was done over about 10 years of time. It looked at 174 individuals, splitting them up into an at-risk population and a mild cognitive impairment population. And they personalized lifestyle programs and precision medicine to each one of the individuals that was in the treatment group. Now, the most interesting piece of that is they had this bar that they called the compliance bar and they were able to track to see if people were actually compliant with all of the different uh, suggestions that they were giving them and they found out that the cutoff was at 60 percent so if individuals were compliant 60 percent of the time or more with all the suggestions then in both the at risk and the mci group those individuals improved versus the control group. What's MCI for people who uh, are unfamiliar? Sure, MCI is mild cognitive impairment and that is the step before dementia. If you have MCI, your risk level is over 50% to uh, head towards, towards dementia. Got it. So with that, we understood that, wow, this personalization is important, but the compliance is even more important. Now, that right there, and they're going to be doing another study. Um, they're actually raising money for it right now to have PET scans involved. So it'll be the same type of study, a few tweaks here and there, but now they're going to have PET scans to actually show, are they reversing the pathology of Alzheimer's as well as improving people's brain function and overall quality of life? Because that is an answer we don't have yet. We don't know if the underlying pathology of the disease is actually being reversed. 
we know that we're improving brain function, improving quality of life for all intents and purposes, sending the disease in a reverse progression, but we don't know if that underlying pathology and Ari, I can get into that, but it's a little bit more technical if you, no, please. If you want me to. I mean, you mentioned, okay. you mentioned sleep. I'm, I'm hesitant to interrupt. You're in a good flow, but yeah. <laughs> a lot of things on my mind that I would like to interject. Sure. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's interesting to, the, to what you were just speaking of there is I, I personally don't necessarily put even that much stock into what you were getting at there, like th that we can yep. measure what we think are the specific mechanisms and show that they've sure. been reversed. And uh, one example of why I say that is um, a few years back, it was thought, you know, all the, these um, amyloid, amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's are the big thing that are, that are causing these disease, th th this disease to progress. So if, yes. and, and there was for years, there was billions of dollars uh, invested in, you know, from pharmaceutical companies investing in uh, yep. developing a drug that would interrupt the biochemical mechanisms of the development of these amyloid plaques. So it's like, okay, we can zero in on these amyloid plaques, see that it's this chemical and that chemical and this enzyme, you know, are involved in, in the steps of building these plaques. And so if we can just develop a drug that interrupts one of these enzymes, then we can stop the synthesis of these plaques or slow it down and That's therefore... Right you know, reverse the progression of the disease. And what was found when they actually developed a drug that effectively did that is it did lower the amount of amyloid plaques, but it accelerated the progression of the disease. So that's right. I'm thinking, you know, my, my personal bias and inclination is that the symptoms and the functionality are much more meaningful metrics. But if you can also show some kind of meaningful reversal at the cellular level or biochemical level, that's great too. Um, but if somebody no longer, if somebody's got normal brain function and they used to have very poor brain function, I think that's a lot more meaningful uh, as far as an end result to measure. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and I, I think it's important for science and the movement forward to kind of shift the overall thought of, of what is this disease to show that in brain scans. Um, but you know, amyloid was our bad guy for years. 65 billion dollars 99.6 percent failure rate in the drug trials they're still running drug trials for that but two of the biggest drug companies have pulled out because they they no longer want to spend their money in that area and i think it's more important to ask the question and a lot of the researchers and scientists and and clinicians have been asking this question what's producing that amyloid in the first place yeah why are these brains producing more of it than they than they should be and when is it starting and that goes back to these, these different underlying causes that are insulting the brain to cause the brain to produce beta amyloid plaque or tau proteins. And how is this happening? And can we stop those mechanisms of action upstream to cause a downstream effect? Yeah. That's where we're looking. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's likely to result in much more benefits to look at things yes. that way. As, a, as an yes. aside, um, it's worth mentioning, I think a lot of people don't know this, that we naturally, every single day, accumulate some degree of amyloid in the brain just through normal daily living. And like everybody has some degree yep. of buildup of these amyloid proteins in the brain. And to the point of, you know, importance of emphasizing the importance of sleep, every night while we sleep, we, our brains clear out a lot of the built up amyloid from that day. So um, we also know, I'll add as another layer here, there's a, a, a large body of research as you were talking about linking sleep, but also there's a whole body of research linking disrupted circadian rhythm to mm -hmm. these neurodegenerative diseases. And so we know if you have disrupted circadian rhythm, if you don't have quality sleep or enough sleep or a combination of the two or a combination of all of those factors, now every night when your brain's supposed to be clearing out all of that amyloid and doing all those repair processes, it's not fully doing it. Let's say it's doing only 75% of what should be 100% of the job, but then you do that every night Month Compound. after month, year after year, decade after decade, well, it adds up, you know? Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and I think that's the case with, with all the different lifestyle choices. So if you're, if you're not meditating or clearing your mind, you're dealing with chronic stress year over year over year, it's going to do the same thing. If you don't exercise over time, your muscles are going to fatigue. It's just a compounding effect with all of these. What we're seeing with cognitive decline is it's, it's kind of like that, like the king of the chronic diseases where it's all of these in combination that have built up over years and decades. The brain is really resilient, but it gets to a point where it just says, you know, I've kind of taken enough. Yeah. <laughs> I can't keep going down this road. Yeah. And, and this is, I think what we're getting at here is the, the biggest flaw with the pharmaceutical model and the conventional medical sure. model approach to these chronic diseases, which is yeah. that model works really great in wartime medicine, works really great in emergency yeah. medicine. There are certain areas where it's absolutely miraculous and life-saving, uh, especially in the context of emergency medicine or acute infections and yes. uh, trauma and things like that. But where it's been almost a universal failure is in the context of chronic diseases of lifestyle. And it's yes. because what we're finding over and over again is that, as you're saying, this, this big constellation of multiple variable, variables and dozens of different pathways are adding up in, 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 over a long period of time. And so when we reduce things down to this one particular process is the, the, the cause, quote unquote, of this disease. And we're going to develop a drug that, you know, interrupts this particular pathological biochemical process. I mean, it's almost destined for failure. And it's, I mean, 99.6%, sure. I'm sure lots of other diseases of lifestyle have similar failure rates. Um, the, I think the story of Dale Bredesen is interesting because I've heard him talk about this yes. where he says, I think his wife is a doctor or a researcher and his wife is of a more naturalistic mindset that is more inclined to, um, and you, you know him better than I do. So I've, I've only heard this yeah. story one time, but I remember um, he basically said that his wife, who's kind of more into nutrition and lifestyle factors was telling him, you know, the, the cure is not going to be in a drug. You know, the cure for Alzheimer's is not going to be in a drug. And he said, no, you're wrong. Like, I'm going to find the cure to this. We're on the verge of finding the cure. And, yep. you know, he poured his heart and soul for, for years and years and years into yeah. developing a drug cure for it. And then eventually realized, hey, you know, my wife was pretty smart. And I, she actually had it right. The, the <laughs> cure is not going to be a drug interrupting one specific biochemical pathway. It's going to be addressing a comprehensive way, all of the environment, environmental lifestyle, nutritional factors that are driving the disease processes in the first place. You got it. Yeah. And, and Dale and his wife are, are both incredible. And what Dale has done for this, this whole field is just an enormous service. Uh, what we're trying to do is, is pump more clinical grade research back into that so that we can all work together to collaborate on, on finding, you know, the, the right, uh, right pieces in lifestyle for the right set of people. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, you know, where to bring you back to what you were just talking about with chronic disease, I think there's this misconception in a lot of individuals' minds that the medical system is there to keep them healthy. And that's not what it's built for. You know, we have a medical system that was built for acute care. It's focused on disease management and, you know, the, it, it's incredible with acute care. You talked about wartime medicine and emergency medicine. That's what it's designed for. But right now, 86% of the insurance dollars up until probably the last month and a half, uh, were going towards chronic disease. And that's, that's crazy when we're using a system for what it was not built for. And it doesn't have anything to do with promoting health. That should be left up to the individual. And I think we just, you know, unfortunately, we, we think of medical insurance different than any other type of insurance. You wouldn't ever bring your car in to the auto mechanic and say, you know, I want to pay for my oil change with my auto insurance card. It, it's silly to think about that of the preventative measures that you need to take to keep your car going longer. We pay for those and we never think about it. But in health, we believe all that should be on the medical system. We're trying to, to educate individuals that they need to be in control of that. And just like financial investing, 
if you're investing since age 20 and you're putting a little bit away every single month, you're going to be in a really good position by 65, unless of course you, you know, turn 65 on, uh, you know, February 1st of this year. But if you, you know, a little bit over time compounds and you're in a really good position when you try to retire, if you do the same thing at age 60, you have to put so much more into that bucket to get to the same place. And it's the same thing with health. If you treat your body terribly for years and years and years and you don't sleep and you eat processed foods constantly and you have high chronic stress and you wonder why these chronic diseases take over and then you point back in the medical system and say, well, they're failing me. And we want people to start investing in their own health and especially their brain. I mean, if you think about it, your brain is the accumulation of all of your education, of all of your relationships, of all of your memories for your entire life. It represents the most important investment you've ever had. And if you're not investing back into your brain through your health, you're putting that investment at severe risk. And unfortunately, that's what we're seeing with 70 million Americans falling in that pre-Alzheimer's category. Wow. 70 million? 70. 70 wow. million covers everybody who is at risk uh, through subjective cognitive decline and up until mild cognitive impairment. That wow. doesn't even count the people who have a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So what's the solution? What's the path forward? Uh, you know, having said that probably yeah. we're probably not going to see uh, a, a drug cure for this. Um, what do you think is, is the real solution here? Well, I think the solution is a, is a personalized, proactive medicine and lifestyle approach. Uh, we believe that everything needs to be personalized to that individual, not just for their genetics. And you know, genetics are, again, like you said, a small percentage of this, but in some cases it does count. What we have to do is personalize this to somebody's wants, their needs, their abilities, and their goals. The first question we ever ask is, what are your health goals in a year? Where do you want to be in a year? Where do you want to be in three? Where do you want to be in five years? Because if you don't understand where that person's trying to get, then you can take all these different paths to try to get them there, and they're never going to be happy at the end. We understand that compliance is probably the most important, important piece of this when we talk about lifestyle. If somebody is making the changes, they're going to tend to get better in a large percentage of the, of the time. If they're not, they're not going to. And we've seen this in some great studies of recently. So we need to enable that in a way and look outside of the borders of medicine and say, how can we take behavior change and bring that in, you know, behavior design and lifestyle design and bring those into personalized programs to encourage people to actually make these changes that are being set forth by their functional or integrative or natural medicine doctors or their, uh, their personal trainers or their nutritionists or their health coaches. So we believe that a whole team approach needs to be taken. That needs to be personalized for that individual's needs, their unique self, and their goals. And we've designed those programs. They're not for everybody. They are for people who want a really comprehensive approach. But I think people can do this on their own as long as they can kind of clear through the clutter and all the noise and then find a signal and realize that they have to define where they are. They need to clearly understand where they are with their health and their brain function. And most people don't know that. They know their blood pressure, they know their weight, they know their vitals. Not many people know their brain function. They don't understand where their memory is against a comparative normal database of their age group or their decision-making skills or their planning abilities or their attention. And they don't know where they want to go. So they just kind of cruise through life and hope that they're going to get better or not any worse. When we all have the chance, if we, if we understand a little bit more and we have those goals and we have a purpose behind that, we can absolutely get there with the right design plan. Very nice. Uh, so, yeah. so what is your specific approach at Mio's Health? And I know you guys have a very unique way of structuring things, and you're also unique in that you offer a guarantee on the results that people get. So, talk to me about we that. We do. 
Yeah, so that that's the that's a principle that we stand on. We believe, uh, and this is something that I am passionate about changing in medicine. I would like to see nothing more than the model change from this paying for codes and paying for things and stuff and bottles of things to paying for results. There are some companies out there that are that are trying to do this right now and are actually seeing some extreme success even in the payer model for things like diabetes and uh, autoimmune conditions. It's, it's amazing to see the, this. Even in the payer model. Uh, they're even running through insurance and they're making a bet against insurance companies that they don't have to get paid from the insurance company unless they get somebody better, oh, wow. which is just incredible to see that. And there's a lot of data behind it. So they're you know making a risk model to, to get there. What we said when we started Mio's Health was we wanted to be the solution in between the functional medicine and integrative medicine expert doctor who has the education and the expertise, but they don't have the team and the implementation and the technology and all those pieces to help that client get from where they are to where they want to be. And we want to attract and educate those clients to make sure that they're the right fit to work with that doctor and provide them with everything that they need. So we decided that we want to stand on this model of paying for results, which means from the initial assessment, we can get very clear on where you want to be, where your goals are, and where you currently stand. And it's very easy for us to understand if you do these things, you're going to be able to get to this point. We create a realistic goal, and we measure along the way. And you see your progress every step. Every two weeks, we measure your brain function. You wear a continuous glucose monitor and an aura ring, and you actually get to track your all of these different objective measurements throughout time to see yourself improving, even if you don't feel it yet. So it continues this feedback loop of celebration to help people understand that the changes that they're making are really making positive changes, not just for today, but for the long term. Mm -hmm. So we can see if somebody's being compliant or not, and if they are, we want to make sure that they are going to get to the result that they want to get to. And all of our programs are six months. We have different tiers of those programs for whether you're just interested in uh, lowering your risk for Alzheimer's, or if you actually have subjective cognitive decline, you're, you're feeling symptoms and you want to improve your brain function, or if you have mild cognitive impairment and you want to change your trajectory completely. We have different levels of programs that are more and more comprehensive along the way. But each one of them, if we get to that six month mark, if you've done the work and we have a technology platform that we've built and designed that delivers you daily activities, it has everything you need in there. So if we ask you to meditate, you open up the meditation app within our platform instead of going out and saying, well, how do I meditate? What am I supposed to do? Should I do transcendental or mindfulness or what? We make it really simple with choices for people. So if we get to that six month mark and you haven't hit those results, we continue working with you for up to another six months at no further cost until you get to that sustainable result. And then if we still haven't gotten there by a year, we refund your entire program wow. fee. And wow. instead of refunding at six months, it's about the results. If someone's going to stick with it, they want a result. They don't want their money back. But for us, we're not in this business unless we can get people results and those results are going to turn into incredible data that can be fed back into the field that just makes everybody better at this and is going to take the whole field and, and raise it up. Gotcha. So explain, I guess, another la layer of detail as far as how the yes. program works. So let's say, I guess, first of all, who is it for? I think that might be yep. worth saying. So is it with people with full blown, you know, they've already been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or, or what? And then once that's in place, let's say they're interested, they contact you to, to work with you and sign up for this program. How exactly does it work? So it's for people who are diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, uh, not for people who've been diagnosed with a dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So people with mild cognitive impairment all the way down to individuals who are at risk. That person would be somebody who just had a parent who passed from Alzheimer's disease. They know that they have a family history of this. 
that they are at a higher risk of developing the disease someday, but they don't currently have any symptoms and they feel like they could be doing a little bit more to invest in their own, their own health. So we have a broad spectrum of people we work with. Everything starts with an assessment. Um, we do a simple cognitive, online cognitive assessment and some subjective validated questionnaires in the first part of the process, just to see where that person actually fits. And from there, they can go into any level of um, assessment that looks at a significant amount of biomarkers. We can do full, fully at home, 100% virtual take home tests that kind of look at your overall risk platform for Alzheimer's disease, or we can do a thousand biomarker test with MRIs with volumetrics, uh, QEGs for looking at the electrical map of the brain, and you know many, many more things if somebody wants a real deep dive. Um, but that assessment is then interpreted and guided with a functional medicine doctor. And right now, our, um, our, our doctor is Dr. Helen Messier, who's an MD, PhD in San Jose. And uh, she's absolutely incredible. She does deep dives with tons of people in the Silicon Valley and, and people fly in to see her. So you would be working with her to understand that. And we basically take 300 pages of data from nine different labs and put it all into one really simple report that breaks it down by system. So you can understand how these things are looping back and actually affecting those points of decline. We say that they're drivers of your decline and then how those are going to shift over through a, a precision personalized treatment plan to get you to those goals that you have stated you wanna to get to. And then we break down a lifestyle program that's gonna happen over about six months. We assign you a health coach that is really designed around your personality, uh, your behavior types, and we have that individual lead you through a guided education program that is customized over those six months while you're doing that precision functional medicine treatment at the same time, all just dripped out at a cadence that works for you and helps you get to those goals that you're looking for. So it's a very personalized program, a lot of hand-holding, takes all the confusion out of it and just brings clarity where, where there used to be not a whole lot of clarity before for these individuals and their families. Beautiful. Very, very yeah. cool. So um, I guess, I mean, I, I love what you're doing. I think it's Thank fascinating. You. I think it's very, very innovative. I especially love the results guarantee aspect of it. Yeah. I think that is incredibly important. And I think you know, we're, we're in a day and age where there's so many charlatans out there. There's so many people who are happy to, to take your money and give you nothing yeah. of value in return or give you gimmicky pseudoscience and nonsense in return. Um, right. And there's so little accountability for, for stuff that doesn't work. Um, sure. You know, I, I, this is a bit of a digression, but and, I just heard. And reporting. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I, I mean, I just heard uh, actually a guy who's, who's an MD, um, Dr. Demania. He's got a big following online. Um, he, he's, he's Mr. Conventional Medicine. I mean, he, this is a guy who bashes everything that is not conventional medicine, kind of con is convinced everything outside of convention and conventional medicine must be quackery and, and nonsense by definition, because if it had any evidence to support it, it would already be incorporated into conventional <laughs> medicine, you know, this kind of, kind of belief system. Um, but even he was saying, hey, why is it that in the U.S. we spend more money per capita on healthcare and on medical interventions and yet have some of the lowest, the worst outcomes of any Western country? And it, it was a moment, this is someone I don't agree with a lot of what he says, but in this particular video, he was just spot on. Um, and he said, it's because, you know, a lot of these other countries do less, they do less medical interventions. And he was saying yep. explicitly, so his words, not mine, he was saying a large portion of what we do as medical interventions within conventional medicine don't work. They don't really have good data to support that they have strong benefits. 
And right. he was really saying like, if you want to have improve your health, stay out of the medical system, stay out of the hospitals, take care of your health. And I thought it was a beautiful shift from someone who's so, you know, hardcore conventional medicine yeah. to be saying, stay away from, from us. The best thing that you can do for your health is stay away from us, stay out of the medical system. So you don't need our treatments by protecting your health with nutrition and lifestyle factors. And, um, and the fact that he ex explicitly pointed out that these other countries have better outcomes because they're receiving less medical care, which is a whole other topic we could talk about is the, you know, the role of medical errors and iatrogenic sure. death. Iatrogenics, you're right. And, and, yeah. um, and unnecessary medical interventions that actually make outcomes worse, uh, which sure. is itself an epidemic, I don't, uh, deserves its own hours of conversation to, to treat those topics with the complexity and nuance they deserve. But um, my point is, this: what he was saying is really, hey, we have so much stuff that we are doing commonly so much iatrogenic death, hundreds of thousands of, of deaths induced by medications and medical errors. And we're not really being held accountable for the results right. we're getting. Um, so I think this is a beautiful shift uh, and, and hopefully takes hold and spreads that more and more companies can operate with this level of integrity to say, hey, we're going to guarantee you get results and and uh, or, or we're going to give you your money back. And I do the same yeah. with my, my own business. All my products have that, that same guarantee. Um, yep. So I get it. And I think it's beautiful that you're doing that, especially with something where you invest months of services that are already rendered. I mean, it's very difficult to, to, to have a guarantee on that when you've sure. already invested so many man hours. So I, I really applaud you for that. I guess I want to ask you, you to, to, on a final note, is there any other thing you want to mention here before we wrap up? No, I think we, I think we uh, covered a whole lot of this. Um, you know, we, we're recording this at a very interesting time, and uh, we're, we're seeing a, a medical pandemic on our hands, and we have an obvious, obvious, you know, villain in COVID-19 that we're going after. And I think that the one thing I would ask of the audience is to, to broaden their mindset to uh, these chronic diseases, especially Alzheimer's disease and other forms of neurodegeneration that, you know, we may not have a, have a villain, villain yet for, but they can take control now and do something for their health that is going to drastically lower their risk down the line. Invest now in your brain because investing now in your brain will pay off in dividends in year, extra years of beautiful beautiful energy and beautiful vitality and, and life that you can enjoy with your loved ones down the road. So yeah. I just beautiful. would like people to, you know, invest in their health a little bit more. Beautifully said. Uh, if somebody's interested in working with you, what's the best place to reach out to you and get started? Yeah, I think it's uh, on our website, uh, mioshealth.com. And you'll see an apply now button in the top right. And they can click that and, and find their way through a, a little subjective questionnaire that'll immediately tell them where they stand. Um, they can go from there for, to a free 45 minute call where we just help them understand a little bit of clarity around where they are and where they want to be, which then moves them, moves them through the system if they're going to be the right fit. So we like to, we like to have a lot of time with people and, and give them as much advice and direction as we possibly can before ever uh, having any sort of financial you know, financial agreement in there. So it's, it's really a service that we want to put out there. And that comes from, from all of us here at, at our, at Mio's Health and, and our passion for this disease and wanting to change the way we do medicine. Wonderful. The website again is it's mioshealth.com. Yep. M-I-O-S health.com. Wonderful. Seth, thank yeah. you so much for coming on. All right, thank and, you. And sharing your knowledge and, and letting people know about this really innovative new program that you're offering for the huge amount, I didn't know it was 70 million. That's pretty mind blowing to me. Yeah. The huge amount of people <laughs> that are dealing people. with mild cognitive impairment and are at risk for developing yep. Alzheimer's and dementia. So thank you again for coming on the show. This, this was a lot of fun and I, I hope we can talk more in the future. Thank you, Ari. I appreciate everything you do.
Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. Hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week.